Hello and welcome to our credit hangout on how to deal with student loan debt. I'm super excited to have a panel of awesome people here to share their advice and experience with paying down debt. We have a number of, of panelists. First we have Susanna Snyder. Uh, Susanna co covers higher education for Kiplinger's Personal Finance Magazine. We also have Joe Mahalik, author and founder of NoMoreHarvardDebt.com, where he shares his, his experiences paying down $90,000 in college debt in seven months. We also have Betsy Mayo, the Director of Regulatory Compliance for the American Student Asso Assistance. She also writes for saltmoney.org. We have Brandon Ensley, who is the Financial Aid Administrator at Purdue University and oversees financial literacy and Purdue's Buy Money website. We have Stephanie Halligan. She's the founder and blogger behind the Empowered Dollar and started a new awesome web comic series to help people achieve financial freedom. She's also working with startups and nonprofit design financial education apps. And we have Claire Murdo, who is one of the awesome writers at Ready for Zero and is getting featured all over the web. I just saw her article appear in Business Insider yesterday. And last we have, sorry, we have John Dervanis, who is at Experian, our analytics consultant. He has 20 years of experience working in the consumer finance industry with JP Morgan Chase and Capital One Financial. I want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Mike Delgado. I'm the host. If you have any questions during this discussion, you can tweet out your questions using the credit hangout hashtag and we'll see it. Or if you're watching on YouTube, there's a little uh, Q&A widget and simply by clicking on it, you can chat with us right there. Before we get started, I want to ask John um, if he can share a little bit about what's happening in student debt and what are the recent numbers. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's, uh really interesting story looking at some of the numbers over the last few years. Um, the student loan market has increased significantly over the past several years. Outstanding debt has gone um, from in 2007 it was around 550 billion to nearly 1 trillion um, in total debt. Uh, balances of student loans are now greater than any other consumer loan product with the exception of residential mortgage. Um, so that's quite an amazing story. And Really, when we had the financial crisis, it was sort of the only form of debt that kept going up through that uh, period. Everything else sort of deleveraged or went down, but this particular asset class kept going up. So it is now greater than credit card, home equity, and auto, um, and that wasn't the case in the past. And so um, if you look at that chart, you can sort of see everything deleveraging going down, um, except for student loans keep going up and um, continue to rise, and like I said, is now the second biggest behind mortgage. Thanks so much, John. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, what do you wish you knew before you took out loans for college? I, I would start by saying well, I wish I knew everything. I feel like I started with zero information on student loan debt. Um, I didn't really know, I didn't understand what it meant. I mean, I kind of did in the Vegas sense, but I didn't really connect with the meaning of student loan debt um, and I kind of just followed followed the the paper uh, trail to take it out. I didn't really have conversations with anyone about it. Um, a little bit with my family because they were a part of the decision but I, I, I really look back now and, and I, I feel like I would have appreciated some sort of financial aid guru to lead me through it or just conversation about it in general maybe maybe in my high school anybody who was prepping me um, to, to go on to higher education yeah I'm gonna uh, this is Stephanie I'm gonna agree with Claire totally which is that I wish I had some sort of guidance um, I was the first person in my family to go to college and so getting that financial aid package was just it felt like it, it, it was what it was and um, I just kind of accepted it at face value. So, um, yeah, some sort of guidance, and I think especially um, information knowing that I didn't have to borrow the full amount of the loans I was mm -hmm. offered. I don't think that was ever a, a point that was brought up to me. Um, I wish I knew that in hindsight for sure. I've gotten a few notes from folks that uh, sort of describe the situation that they're in, um, you know, 40, 50K in debt and they studied English or philosophy in college. So um, I think, and, and I did this, which is why I was able to pay off my loan so quickly. I looked at what major I was going to have, I looked at what school I was going to, and I looked at sort of the expected salary for graduates, and I looked at the numbers, and I, 
I knew I'd be making X amount of dollars and my student loans were, were Y dollars. And so, you know, I looked at what I'd be owing on a monthly basis, how much I would probably be making on a monthly basis, and then what other costs would be in, involved in my life, uh, you know, car costs, uh, living costs, living expenses, and then just did the math. Can you, can you make the payment on a monthly basis? I think too many folks get excited about going to school and, and, uh, and they just sort of plunge into it and they don't really pay attention to what's going to happen afterwards in terms of are they, are they setting themselves up for, a, for a, a reasonable lifestyle in terms of the, the, uh, the loan payment and, and their salary that they'll be making after they graduate. It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to look at because your major can change so often and, and there's a part that everybody should follow their dreams regardless of what the financial situation is on the back end. But I still think that you know, there has to be that element or that component of just making sure it, it smells right. It doesn't necessarily have to be like perfect, but you should at least, you should not be taking out 100K and studying a major that will you know, probably net you like 30 grand a year. That's, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. and, you know, to echo um, some of Joe's thoughts as well, um, a, a lot of times folks take out loans and they don't understand the deferment process and that interest is accumulating through that process. So you may be taking out those loans for a couple thousand dollars and when you get out, you find out that you owe 35 or 4,000 on those type of loans. So, you know, knowing those type of things, how that process works, uh, how the interest can pile up, and sort of what your end number is going to be is really, really important as well. And that sort of echoes to what he was saying. And that you can pay that interest while you're in school. It doesn't have to all be added on at the by the time you get out of school. Um, I hear from a lot of consumers that they wish they knew or someone had pointed out to them that they could be and should be paying that interest that's accruing while they're in school. Brandon, I wanted to ask you about, you know, you work a lot with a lot of students at Purdue. I wanted to ask you, what, what are some of the advice you give them as they are looking to get their, their first set of loans? Um, well, especially the incoming freshmen or if we have students that are looking on campus, I try to make them look at the whole picture. Um, with the My Money program that we have, um, we are able to go into classrooms and we're ever expanding on it. And uh, a lot of families will look at the price tag at one year and realize, oh, I can afford that. Um, but that's based off of one year's finances and so much can change from one year to the next. And we see a lot of students taking out a lot more student loans to finish off their degree than they thought, um, even if they were planners, even if they did think about it. Um, because something unexpected happened and some of their financial aid drops. So we try to make sure that they are looking at college as a whole um, and not even just four years anymore but even five or six because the mm. average is constantly going up just to get your undergraduate degree. Mm. Um, and one of our mindsets that's really changed is we no longer look at the loans um, you know, as an all, end all be all option, especially the parent plus loan we don't even award that to our out-of-state freshmen anymore, uh, or our out-of-state students at all, so they don't think that that is something they can automatically take. Um, and we always go back to, yes, this may be your dream institution, just like any other of your institutions. This may be something you've been thinking about for a very long time, um, but is it realistic? Um, can you go somewhere else and get the same degree at a third of the cost? Mm. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, are there any any common mistakes that students make when they're in the process of taking out loans or as they're looking at loan options? For us, well, we see a lot of students, um, they can be shy to ask questions. Um, and asking some of the simplest questions can get can make a snowball effect of asking more questions and asking more questions. Um, I've seen lots of students go through all four years and get private loans the entire time and had no clue that they were eligible for the, uh, the lower, the federal loans just because someone told them at one point in time they made too much money. They never tried to look at the FAFSA. Um, we've had students that would apply for the FAFSA, end up getting grants along with student loans, and would have just went through the whole, their whole career with private student loans. Um, and there's a lot of different stipulations within the federal regulations that can um, help a student instead of hinder them with a private loan. Um, 
Um, you know, your your federal loans are going to be much easier to work with the servicer, to work with the lender, than a private institution is going to. Stephanie already mentioned it, but uh, taking out more um, than you need for your loans. Um, I think when somebody gives you uh, an offer or just kind of a bundle of cash, or even if it's, you know, you didn't know that college was a possibility and all of a sudden the college comes along and offers you the full ride but it's mm -hmm. with within right. loans then you kind of you grab it and it's appealing and it all of a sudden opens up the door that maybe you didn't think was open however it's like you know it's kind of a mystery door um, at that point and the actual cost of these loans isn't taken into an account into account whereas maybe yeah you go to a different school who will give you a decent amount or just what you would need to get through and you can take care of the rest um, find out other ways uh, at a much much lower cost but yeah that kind of golden nugget of student loans um, right. that's offered mm -hmm. like you know a lot of people will grab it and, and and that's one thing that happens I think quite a bit and it's you know it's appealing they, they, they package it well yeah. Very, I mean, very much so. And, and in addition to that, it's a lot of times this is the student's first time with this much money at one point in time. Um, so we were seeing a lot of students just overspending, um, buying things they really met, might, might not necessarily need it. Um, so we have implemented, a uh, with all of our scholarship programs, a finance class that they take. So we, we kind of go through budgeting and, and worksheets and and see, you know, do you really need that or can you live without it while you're uh, a college student? Something to add to that, too, is um, I actually just wrote a long story about this, is that students start thinking about loans and financial aid in general when the acceptance letters start coming in. And they mm -hmm. should be thinking about it six months to a year before they even start school and start applying. What schools might be able to give me more aid based on my academics or my activities and what schools may not give me any at all. So just really thinking about that early is something that we don't see as many students do as probably should. Yeah, and I would have to agree that um, with all of those points and the fact that you, as a senior in high school you make such a big push to apply for scholarships compare your financial aid packages and I feel like when you get into college the idea that you should keep applying for scholarships and you should keep pace on looking for different kinds of um, funding options besides loans it kind of disappears because you've already you've made it and, and there was such a big push into freshman year so I know personally I didn't even consider looking for scholarship opportunities while I was in college and I know there are still a few out there so um, and we see that kind of, I think, spike in cost after that first year. So continuing to find other aid sources, I think, is a really important uh, component to keeping the student loan um, balance down. I would agree with that. And, and to add on to your guys' point, um, not even six months to a year before you start, but it's federal regulation now that universities have a cost calculator and a financial aid estimator. So even their first year of... of high school, they can start planning this out and seeing at this point in time, what can I potentially uh, qualify for? Mm -hmm. That's true. The other thing that people run into, I think, you know, we were talking about the financial aid packages. There's some people that don't realize when they look at their award letter that just because it's on the award letter doesn't mean that it's free money, that there are, you know, every award letter looks a little different and some make it very clear what's loans versus what's grants and scholarships but families should absolutely don't assume that because it's on the award letter that it's free money. Mm. I, want to, I want to ask about paying off debt faster and Betsy is something you touched on about the idea to even begin to start paying down the debt while you're in school. That's something I never even thought about when I was in college. Can you talk a little bit about that and the value of doing that? Sure. Well, the first thing is, you know, if you don't remember anything else from this, just remember there's, there's never a prepay, prepayment penalty on student loans. So you can start making payments the day it's dispersed. Um, and if it's a loan that accrues interest while you're in school or while you're in deferment, then that's less money that's going to be added on to the principal once you are out of school. If you're lucky enough that you qualified for subsidized loans, whether it be a subsidized Stafford loan or a Perkins loan, which also has a subsidy, any money that you pay towards that loan while you're in school is essentially free money because no interest is, is accruing on it in the first place. 
that can save people thousands and thousands of interest over the life of the loan if they just sort of keep up with that interest that's accruing over time. Mm. You know, another... Um, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, um, I think that's a great idea, Betsy. And, and the beauty of college is that it's the one time in your life where you're basically allowed to dress like a slob, uh, <laughs> drive a beer, and have ten roommates. <laughs> so, and, you know, there are so many ways to save money, um, and nobody expects you to have the latest fashions in college. No one expects you to buy bottle service. No one expects you to live in a house, like, you know, by yourself or, or in, a, in a penthouse suite downtown. Like, you can literally just, like, shovel all money that you have um, from working a day, a day job or a night job or what have you and uh, just shovel it all towards, all towards this, these interest payments that Betsy's talking about because nobody expects you to look like a successful person when you're in college. Like, you are in the ditches, you're learning, you're building yourself, you're enriching your life, um, and you're not making yourself richer at that point. Um, that comes later. And so I think it's just an excellent opportunity to, to really just take full advantage of dressing like a slob and just <laughs> driving a car you don't care about and just not worrying about these societal pressures that we have to, to look our best or to, 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 to you know, portray this, this, uh, this, this, this vision that, that we're super successful. We're not. We're in college. Um, so don't don't put up this front, put all the money towards interest, and, and you will thank yourself later when you have um, less of a, of a debt burden later on. And, and you know another option to look at or consider is, um, and this maybe applies more when you get out, is really looking at, um, again, the amortization schedule of that loan. So if you had a $20, $29,000 balance on your loan and um, your payment's around $200, if you look at it, um, $70 of that's going towards principal and the other 130 is going towards interest. So if you could find another $70 to pay that month, you have essentially made two payments for that month. And if you could keep that up, um, you are on a pace to pay your loans off in a much quicker time. So surprisingly, sometimes the amount of principal is small, but by making an, an extra principal payment on, on that situation, you can quickly start paying down the loan. And one of my favorite ways that uh, most college students can do is use unexpected windfalls or expected ones. Um, most college students, year in and year out, will get a tax refund. And that it's a perfect chunk of money every year that you can go and pay off a nice portion of your principal before you even get out. Mm -hmm. There's something that I would sort of caution. I think paying off your student loans fast is obviously smart. Putting extra money towards them is you know, good financial housekeeping. But don't forget to also have a sort of full financial profile that's healthy. So you still need an emergency fund if there are medical costs or emergency travel. Um, so you know, don't pay off your student loans at the expense of everything else. Do it in addition to things like saving and to having extra money on hand. So that's something to keep in mind. I think some students believe it's bad, but if, if it's manageable payments and you don't have an emergency fund, you might want to think about balancing that out as well. That's a great point. Yeah, I would add uh, along the lines of extra income, I'm a huge, huge advocate of negotiating. I think that's a general um, issue that a lot of grads face uh, with their money in general, which is not negotiating their very first salary up or um, not negotiating a, a raise throughout their first job just because I know for me I was just so happy to have a job um, that I, I it didn't it took me a while to get up the, the nerve to actually ask for more. Um, mm. But again, if, if, if cash flow is an issue and paying off your debt is a priority, um, looking at the other other side of the equation, which is how do I get more money into my life? And so many people are afraid of asking that um, it, it never hurts to ask, and, and it could be a huge boost to how quickly you can pay off your debt after you graduate. That's great. We, we just got a tweet um, coming in uh, from Lama on Twitter, and she asked, how do you prioritize student loan debt, credit card debt, emergency fund, which comes first? Well, I, I think the I answer to that is yes, all of them. <laughs> well, you yeah, really want to take a yeah, go ahead, John. I was gonna say you really want to take a look at um, which one's your most expensive loan and um, try to form a plan around tackling the one that's um, the most expensive. So if you have a credit card at eighteen percent um, and a student loan at three percent, you know it might make sense to tackle that one first. Um, 
you know, because on a sort of aggregate basis, you're gonna you're gonna do better off paying off your more expensive loans and sort of again formulate a plan, figure out which ones are the more expensive, and sort of work work that plan down um, to the point to get to the ones that are cheaper. I, I would have to go along with Susanna with this one because um, you know if you if you don't have that emergency build up, emergency fund built up first, you could find yourself using a credit card for unnecessary expenses down the road and just getting yourself into more financial trouble. Sure. Yeah, and I would say, I would say that um, uh, that credit card debt is super toxic, I think, just for, based on the math. So making sure that you are paying more than the minimum on that, is, I think, is really important just to get ahead financially, for sure. Joe, Joe I wanted to ask you about you know, when you when you finish school and you obviously tackled ninety thousand dollars in debt in seven months, what was your approach and thought process on how you were going to think about you know how much money you want to have in the bank, how much money you were going to pay off certain debts? Like, what was your thought process? Yeah, so I started with um, I had about a thousand dollars in my emergency fund, so my mortgage was fifteen hundred dollars. So I I didn't really have uh, I had maybe a half half a month of of savings um, in my emergency fund, so I was, I was like a razor blade away from being in dire. Um, so I choose to go beef up your emergency fund first. I mean, I would I would recommend that. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that, but it was all about the psychological gains. So I just knocked out some smaller student debts first, even though the interest rates were lower. Uh, I think it's you know I think John was saying that uh, maybe it was Brandon. I've, I apologize, I forgot. But um, the the higher the interest rate, it's better to go after that one from a, from a purely financial standpoint. But the ability to just knock out like a five thousand dollar loan right away um, was just sort of the the motivation I needed getting out of the gate to just mm-hmm. keep on going, knowing that it's possible to actually pay off student loan um, and say, you know, to the bank, I don't need you anymore. Here's your money. Um, it was really it was really uh, really motivating. I think that's a good point too because I think an important part of paying it off is also like there it's tricky because it is your finances but there is going to be a little bit of that trial and error in figuring out what works best for you and what will be the most sustainable route for you like because essentially there can be different approaches to paying it off but you want the one that's going to that you're going to stick with not the one that necessarily someone says is the best and so in some cases you know uh, that that's super motivating and um, and uh, I'm just happy too that we are even talking about the uh, the kind of like to build up an emergency fund as you're you're paying off your student loan debt because I feel like student loan debt is in the news so often to just get rid of it and it kind of like puts a fire under your butt kind of to just like want to get it out of your life that that hasn't been a part of the conversation and now I'm starting to see more and more that people are like no you got to have yeah like you said a, a balanced financial plan of attack as well the other thing about that, though, is that it, while it is important to get rid of your debt as, as soon as you can, the nice thing about student loans is that there's options. So if you do get into a jam, like if you lose your job or you you're, there's a reduction in income, that there are options that are available to you so you don't go into default and have more dire consequences. And these are options that aren't available in most, if not all, other types of consumer debt. So that's a good cautionary tale. Definitely, and if you can kind of tackle your private loans first, if you've taken those out because they have fewer protections, they'll be helpful to knock those out, and then your federal loans can come after. So th- this leads us to a, a question, um, and Betsy, something you touched on about those students or graduates that are that are struggling. W- what is your counsel for them that you know maybe they're out of school and they got their job? And they find themselves in a, in a situation where they're they're barely scraping by, and they're not sure how they're going to even pay their their student loan bills. What what is your advice for them? Well, number one, call your loan holder. Um, you know, especially with federal student loans, there is almost always a solution and a long term solution um, that can help consumers ensure that they're able to sustain um, and make payments on their student loans. To what can be a little trickier is borrowers that have very high private loan debt um, because there aren't as many, as we've already discussed, there aren't as many options. 
So for consumers that have both, I usually advise them to get their federal loan payments down as low as possible and throw as much money as they can at their private loans. Again, because of the lack of protections and generally, although not all the time, private loans have a, a higher interest rate and again, they have less options. Going back to the federal student loans, um, you know, there's there's three different income-based repayment options alone, and that's not even approaching the other lower payment options that are available. There's also deferments, there's forbearances. There really is um, a solution for just about anybody. So again, just make that call, and uh, their servicer would, would will be happy to find them whatever solution is going to work for them. Mike, I'd also I'd also ask you to define scraping by. Because, mm -hmm. you know, scraping by in my mind is, is not the person who's going to the bar three nights a week and spending their money, living paycheck to paycheck that way, you know, going to the mall every week and buying new clothes, um, going on trips. I just completely agree um, with Betsy, but would also um, advocate for taking a very hard look at their expenses. Like, get into your credit card statement, look at it line by line, classify it, entertainment versus, you know, just classified as entertainment discretionary versus required living expense um, and just have an honest conversation with yourself. Do you really need to spend your money the way you're spending it or is there room to cut back a little bit and and put more money towards the student loan? So just a, just a, just a clarification on what, what scraping by means because for some people it's different. That's true. We say it all the time, you know, if you live like a lawyer when you're a student, you're going to live like a student when you're a lawyer. Um, but it's it's like what Joe said, it's want versus need. And you really got to look at the definition of what's need. Oh, but I need cable. No, you don't. You need food. You need basic clothing. It's in some cases, you need transportation. We, we talk about that with consumers all the time. Yeah, and I would say looking at your big needs is really important because I think it's easy to get caught up in, should I buy a latte or a coffee this morning and, you know, save myself $5 a week? Um, when the, maybe the bigger question is, should you get a roommate or two roommates and save five hundred dollars a month? Um, so, I think focusing on those big wins because it's easy to get lost in the minutia and um, and also feel that on a daily basis. When I think there's a lot of bigger opportunities and ways you can save money too, especially living situations. Yeah, and I, I would just say like I am I'm sort of a turnaround story. I uh, I graduated from from B school and I bought a house and I bought two cars and a motorcycle and I didn't I didn't have roommates um, and so I was sort of trying to live like a lawyer but still paying off student debt and you know the net worth situation was was not good at all um, and so it, for me personally speaking it required um, it sort of required it was like basically a self-esteem issue I was very insecure and so I wanted to portray this image of success but at the time all I had was a diploma I hadn't really done anything very remarkable, um, professionally speaking, and so you know, I was trying to portray a certain image, and I think I think that's the case for a lot of people. I think they want to appear to be successful, even though they're not, um, and that comes at a cost, like a real financial cost. And and you know, the self-esteem issue, the insecurities, like that, that's rooted somewhere. And so, just kind of to be very, very, uh, very personal for a minute, just you know, having that that um, self-awareness to determine where this need to consume is coming from and, and, and why you need you feel like feel like, like you need a latte um, every day or like you need to go travel all the time. Like just taking a deeper look at that and determining what's what's driving this need to consume rather than paying off your student loans so that you can set yourself up for a better future. A future where you have savings, where you're retiring early and where you're living your dream maybe when you're forty or fifty versus versus never possibly because you just have this this debt that you have to live with. Yeah, I would echo that. I know I, I really felt like I had to play keeping up with the Joneses because when you have your first job out of college, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by professionals who are just a couple years older than you or your peers. And I think there's a lot of peacocking going on where you're trying to show yourself as a professional and you are you don't want to be the person who's right out of college who only dresses like a college student or can only afford to go out. Um, so it's easy to think to get caught up in your own paycheck sometimes um, and get caught up in, in coworkers and habits of others um, because it's the first time that you're managing money on your own. Yes. Stephanie, um, what was your kind of your plan as you started to as you start to pay up pay off your debt and your friends are inviting you to go to tr on trips or dinners 
Like, what, what's like your response to them? Yeah. Um, so it helped that I was working in the financial education space. So that was easy. I was. I think I was pretty branded as the money conscious <laughs> friend. Um, I actually think I swang the other way too far in terms of the pendulum. It. Uh, I was a little too cheap sometimes, and I would just say absolutely no to going out at all instead of I think. Um, moderation, but, you know, a lot of it was lighthearted, which is people are like, oh, you're not drinking tonight? And I'm like, I, I am, you know, soda and lime. <laughs> like it, and so yeah. it was, I think, using a lot of humor and, and realizing, too, that I still could go out. I still could hang out with friends. Um, I just had to be the one to provide creative solutions, I think, and, and stand my ground um, And when I was really trying to prioritize where I wanted my money to go. Stephanie, you needed one of these. <laughs> this saved me thousands of dollars. Thousands. Oh, I don't man. think the bars like me very much. But, uh, how's, that, how's that for a frugal tip? <laughs> That's right, yeah. The Bring flask. Your own flask. Who knew that student loan debt, uh, Google Hangout, a flask would appear? I <laughs> That's great. That's great. I would name my flask Stafford. I think it would be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to also ask about, um, you know, there's a lot of like student loan consolidation companies out there. What are your thoughts about student loan consolidation? Well, I mean, I. Student loan consolidation, I think, especially people with federal student loans, I think that's their first step now. And student loan consolidation isn't what it used to be. Um, federal student loans used to have a variable interest rate. So if the interest rate was lower for a particular year, everyone would run to consolidate, rightly so, because it would fix the rate at whatever that low rate was that year. Well, now federal student loans are no longer variable. They're fixed rates. So so don't, no one's going to save any money on their interest rate by consolidating their federal student loan. The other reason people used to consolidate was to get all their loans in one place. They'd come out of school, they would have had four years of loans, and it wasn't uncommon to have four different loan servicers. The Department of Education has worked really, really hard to sort of eliminate that problem. Um, so, you know, if you're able to keep track of your bills, um, which if you can't, EFT payments helps. Um, there's really not a lot of benefit to consolidating unless you're trying to lower your payment for the long term. Um, if you have kind of a high debt and the industry that you're going into doesn't pay well, um, extending the term might not be a bad idea. Again, keeping in mind you're going to pay more back at interest. Private student loans are a different story altogether. There's quite a few lenders out there now that are offering private student loan consolidation products, and that can be a great way to refinance that particular type of debt. They're fairly competitive. I think they tend to be more competitive even than the, the initial private loans are. So if you are someone who ended up with that private loan debt for whatever reason, um, private student loan consolidation is worth absolutely worth looking into. Yeah, and some of those folks now are offering fixed rates, and um, there's no origination fees like there was in the old days. So um, yeah, there's a, there's the competition is definitely picking up, and there's some good deals to be had in the private space and consolidation. What I would like to caution people about, though, is there's some companies we're seeing popping up now that are claiming they, they appear to be student loan consolidators, and they're saying, we can get your loans forgiven, and we can refinance your loans, and they charge a pretty significant fee for that service. Be very careful, um, especially if they're working, if they say that they're working in the federal student loan arena. There's only one place to consolidate your federal student loans. You can do that for free. Um, so be very cautious of, of a company that claims to be able to consolidate your loans for you, um, especially if it's for a significant fee. Thanks, Betsy. I wanted to also ask, um, as a final question, what are some, some final tips you would have for those students just about to take loans or tips for those who are just graduating and starting to um, think about paying off their debt? There's uh, one thing for me I know that I personally did, which was to kind of put off my payments uh, for as long as possible, just because the option was there through forbearance and deferment, um, because I, we kind of brought it, touched on the topic, but I thought that I couldn't put 
um, anymore into my student loan debt or I thought that I would have to get my financial situation worked out before I could make any significant pro process or uh, progress on it. But then at that point, I was just uh, accruing interest. Um, I look back now and I was like, of course I could have put a little bit more or I could have uh, rearranged it. So that's one thing too that um, although there are all these like, you know, it's an easy, all of these things that are very easy to do, like you can just apply very easily to put your, your payments on hold or to just pay the minimums. Just look at everything, see what you can pay above the minimum. One thing that really helped me was to actually look at the daily interest that I would be paying um, just to kind of shock me into action because when you start mm -hmm. to see what you're being charged every single day in interest and you realize you could buy two burritos with that, you're, <laughs> you get a little bit motivated. So I wanted my burritos back and um, I, started <laughs> to make, I started to make my payments. Um, but yeah, really just getting that, cl that clear vision and also asking questions. Don't, I mean, in some ways student loan debt is it's, it's a, a debt that nobody really wants to have, but at the same time, it's talked about so often that it almost doesn't have that stigma anymore. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like, it's almost a relief. You can talk about it. You can talk about it with your friends. You can, you, know, you don't have to be embarrassed in, in any way. So, Yeah, I would say for the people who are just about to start paying off their student loans, it's such an emotional thing, I think, once you see the balance or you're afraid to look at the balance. So I would say, like, open the envelope is, like, the biggest, I think, tip, I would say. Like, look at it, calculate it, add up your debt, research who your, um, who your servicer is, and, and look at the number. Because it's easy to not want to look at the number or not uh, add them all up together um, and, I think, sweep it under the rug. Because you, you could feel bitter, bitter or angry or whatever got you into the situation in the first place. So I think accepting it is the first step to, to paying it off. Something that's really easy to do and will help a little bit is just also to sign up for automatic debits when you start repaying your federal loans. So that will earn you a 0.25% interest rate reduction on your, on your rate. So it's free money. I kind of tell everybody to think about just signing up for the auto debit and then you won't miss a student loan payment either. So that's a quick thing you can do right off the bat and it will help a little bit. All these are great tips. I love talking about all these. These are ones that we mentioned with all of our students. Um, but I've also noticed, especially this latest graduation class they go through, is we have a lot of unconventional students out there. Um, and there are many unconventional ways to repay your student debt that a lot of people don't know or don't think about. Um, this week I just read something about the rural opportunity zones in Kansas, where if you move out to Kansas, they are going to forgive portions of your debt. Maine has a program like that. Um, there are other programs like AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps that all have some type of loan forgiveness in there. And for the college student that's looking to do something different, to move and also um, reduce some of their loan debt, it might be an opportunity that they could look into. Actually, Brandon, I'm so glad you brought that up. We um, we discovered a little over a year ago that there wasn't a single source for all the information about all the student loan forgiveness programs that are out there. We actually found over 60 of them, and we put them all together in an ebook, which you can find on our site, on the Salt Money site, um, all the forgiveness programs we could find. And if you guys see it and you know of some programs that we don't even have in that book, let us know, and we'll add them in. Well. I will be looking up uh, that site and, and putting that link on there because I talk about this every year in the classes mm -hmm. and students are always bewildered about um, different ways, different really unconventional ways that they can go out and, and teach or do this or that and, and reduce a big portion of their student loan debt. So I'll, I'll be looking forward towards that, to that link. My favorite one in the book, and I am nerdy enough that I have a favorite student loan forgiveness program. <laughs> <laughs> The state of Kentucky actually reimbur uh, pays up to, I believe it's six grand every single year for veterinarians that will go there and specialize in large food animals, which there's oh, just so many wow. irony in that forgiveness program. Wow. That's great. That's so funny. Yeah. Joe, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, for someone who has tackled a huge amount of debt in such a short amount of time, what would be your advice for the, the person who's just finishing school and looking at their, their debt and they want to be able to do something that you did? What would be, what would be your advice for them? 
for what Stephanie said about opening the envelope, just look that number in the face and do your best not to be intimidated by it because um, you can you can destroy the student loan. Like it's it's just a number. Um, and you know, you have the tools, believe it or not, you have the tools to go destroy it. You're not powerless. Um, it might involve extremes such as moving in with your parents, but so what? Like mm -hmm. free room and board. That's awesome. Um, yeah. If you're living in an expensive metropolitan area, move. And there are loan deferment programs like we just talked about. Move to Kansas, move to Kentucky. Um, you know, it's it's it can be a big number and it can be scary. Um, but you know, believe in yourself really is what it comes down to. And I mean it sounds kinda hokey, but a lot of this is just a mind game at the end of the day. It's how can you push yourself harder to make more money? And how can you push yourself harder to, to make more with less by by having roommates, by by eating ramen noodles, by by doing things that maybe you're not exactly comfortable with right away, like taking a flask to a bar. Extremely uh -huh. comfortable the first time I took it. And I took it every night after that because it's awesome. And I was saying <laughs> so I mean just you know, you have the tools, and the internet has the tools. Like they're all there, and there are people that will support you. Um, so yeah, open the envelope and and just start paying it down. That's great advice. Well, I want to thank you all for for being with us today. Um, there has been a, a number of wonderful tips that we're going to feature on our Experian blog, and as well as links to the different websites that were mentioned, like Betsy just mentioned, a great resource, uh, as well as uh, Brandon at Purdue also has a lot of great resources on the Purdue Financial Aid website. We're going to provide links to all of these different resources, as well as a lot of the tips that are shared. Uh, we'll be uh, typing this all out and having some nice visuals to, uh, to go along with it. So if you'd like to get those things, um, the link will be available um, in the description of this YouTube video, um, or you can just type in the shortened URL that you see there, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash student debt chat, and that'll bring you over to the Experian blog uh, where you'll find links and uh, resources to help uh, help you with the student loan situation, as well as bios and links to, so you can learn more about everyone that has been featured in this chat. I want to thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I want to thank this wonderful panel for being here today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you later.